In most true crime stories, we almost always know right off the bat who we believe. A lot of times we believe the victims in the face of undeniable evidence. And in some cases, we believe the suspects who in the end turn out to be innocent. But once in a while, we do come across stories where we cannot help but stay on the fence. This is how I felt about our next case. For the longest time, I was very much convinced that justice had been done and the people who were jailed for the crimes committed in this case deserved what they got. This all changed when I and a million other Filipinos got to watch an indie documentary called Give Up Tomorrow. Suddenly, we collectively doubted the stories we were fed by the media, the sensationalist headlines we were bombarded with in the late 90s about two Cebuana sisters who were apparently abducted, raped, and killed by a gang of belligerent, spoiled, well-off, and bratty rich boys with prominent and political connections. Suddenly, we had to collectively process information we did not get to hear and see more than a decade earlier. With the documentary came a shift in opinion, not only about who hurt these girls, but also about how the police and other agencies in the criminal justice system do their jobs. This is the story of the Chong sisters and the Chong Seven. Mabuhay. Welcome to another episode of Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. I am your host, Christine, and I am glad you could drop by and listen. Please note that details in the following story can be upsetting and disturbing to some people. So please take care of yourself whilst listening. The year is 1997, and we find ourselves in Cebu the queen city of the south and the oldest post-colonial city of the Philippines. What started out as a normal day on the 18th of July would not end normally at all. A local resident of Tanawan Karkar Cebu made a gruesome discovery at the foot of a cliff. Rudy Lasaga, quite shaken still, immediately called and reported his discovery to the police. He told them that he found the lifeless body of a young woman. The police would later describe how the young woman's left wrist was handcuffed, how her trousers were torn, how her orange t-shirt was raised up, exposing her chest, and how her bra was pulled down. The police also immediately noticed how the young woman's face and neck were covered in masking tape. The gruesome sight in front of them already gave them the feeling then that this would not be an easy case. At that time, the identity of the young woman was still unknown, but somewhere in another part of Cebu on the 19th of July, a young man's ears perked up when he heard the news about the dead woman found in Karkara. He probably got a weird gut feeling about the news he just heard because just three days ago, his sisters, Jacqueline and Mari Joy Chong failed to come home. The family had been in distress since then. The young man, Dennis Chong, and other family members then made their way to the funeral home where the still nameless dead woman was brought. It immediately became clear to the family that the young lady found lifeless in Karkar was indeed Mari Joy. She was still wearing the same orange t-shirt and jeans she wore when she left home on the 16th of July, 1997. Identifying her must have been such a punch in the gut to the Chong family and their relatives, especially to her mother, Thelma Chong. Immediately, questions were raised as to where the other sister was. Where was Jacqueline? Was she perhaps also dead? Was her body also dumped near where Maddie Joy was found? These questions swirled around for the first few days of the investigation. 
In a lot of police investigations, if not all of them, investigators would look at the victim's family and friends before looking at the possibility of having a perpetrator who was unknown to the victim. In this case, I'm not sure if the police had actually looked closely at the family, but we do know that the police put together a list of juvenile delinquents, perhaps their quote-unquote usual suspects. I'm not sure why they focused on juveniles when the crime could so easily have been perpetrated by a full-grown adult, but here we are. Just for clarity, the police authority initially involved in investigating this case was the National Bureau of Investigation, or NBI. In the documentary, Give Up Tomorrow, which I will reference a lot of times here and discuss a bit more in depth later, the person, then Police Inspector Labra, who eventually obtained this NBI list of juvenile delinquents, decided to arrest the people on that list. This did not sit right with the NBI, who thought that Labra was acting prematurely. When Labra was asked in the documentary why he proceeded to arrest the young people on that list, he either did not want to comment or simply said that he could not remember the reason why. An odd reaction, for sure. As fate would have it, one of the names on that list was Paco Laranaga's name. He was written up for a fight in a public parking lot back in 1995, but the incident was eventually dismissed. Unfortunately for Paco, however, his name as a result of the incident landed on the NBI list that Labra had obtained from the NBI. Now, before I go any further, I do want you to bear in mind that this documentary was made by individuals who are related to Paco, and they said as much at the end of the documentary for the sake of transparency. So the information that we get from the documentary should at least be looked at with a little bit of skepticism. Now back to 1997. We know now that after the list landed in the hands of Labra, Paco was arrested in Manila on the 15th of September 1997. Paco, who is originally from Cebu, was living in Manila at the time because of school. He was a culinary arts student. The officers who arrived at his school and eventually arrested him expressed that he would be brought to Camp Crame, the PNP National Headquarters. Paco's sister and her husband, who received a call from a rather distressed Paco, rushed to his school to see what was going on. They were told that the reason their brother was being arrested was that he was being suspected of being involved in the disappearance of the Chong sisters and the murder of Marijoy. When the officers were asked when the crime took place and they then told Paco and his sister that this happened on the 16th of July, the Laranagas breathed a sigh of relief. It was clear to them that Paco was not involved. He could not have been. That evening and the days after, he was in Manila and never left for Cebu. Apparently, they even asked the school's register to show the officers the class attendance sheets that showed Paco being present at his school in Manila on the 16th and 17th of July. Nevertheless, Paco was still arrested, but he was subsequently released on the condition that he would fly back to Cebu the next day for further police questioning. It was at this juncture that Paco would later look back and say that he could have just absconded and left the country. People who knew him certainly advised him to do so. According to Paco, he was not interested in doing that because he had nothing to hide. And so, Paco flew back to Cebu and was further questioned by the police. After the questioning, the public would wake up to the news that not only was Paco rearrested, but six other young men were arrested with him as suspects of the Chong murder case. The other men who were arrested were Josman Asnar, Rowen Adlawan, James Andrew Uy, James Anthony Uy, Albert Cao, and Ariel Balanasag. 
his family did not take kindly to Paco being portrayed as the leader of this gang of seven, especially because Paco would later insist that he did not even know most of the men arrested with him. He was only familiar with Rowen Adlawan and Josman Aznar. Interestingly enough, in the documentary, much time was dedicated to highlighting how the media played a significant role in demonizing Paco as he slowly but surely became the face of the so-called Chong Seven. He seemed to be the most vilified and one quick Google search would show you that 99 or 98 percent of the news articles or videos about the Chong sisters and about that case would also be about Paco. There was barely anything there to read about the six other men. In any case, the media saw there was a particular interest from the masses in Paco being rich, being half Spanish, being related to the Osmania family of Cebu, a prominent political clan that produced at least one president in the past, and having a rather bad boy image in Cebu. Now, following the arrest, Paco and presumably the others as well petitioned that they'd be released on bail on grounds that their arrest was illegal. This was denied and all seven men were ordered to stay in custody whilst the preliminary investigation was being conducted. Evidence-wise, according to the documentary, there was not much to speak of. So the seven men waited for evidence for a long time during the preliminary investigation. By the sixth month of their incarceration, the police still could not present any evidence that could link the seven men to the crime. Now, bear in mind that around the same time, 42 witnesses signed an affidavit whilst the police investigation was still ongoing. They all swore that they saw Paco and or were with him on the date the Chong sisters were abducted. These witnesses were never interviewed by the police as part of their investigation. It does therefore beg the question what the police were investigating since they have known about Paco's presence in school from when they first arrested him six months prior. It is also a worrying thought that the police, equally, did not apply any due diligence in their investigation when looking into the other six men. Again, information about the six other men is scarce because Paco was sort of a representation of all of them. Whilst all of this was ongoing, the family stated in the documentary that the media had become very much anti-Paco. This, in turn, inevitably influenced the public's opinion about Paco and the other men. As a result, his lawyer sought to change the venue of the preliminary criminal proceedings from Cebu to Manila, but this motion was denied. As the investigation progressed, information came out about how Paco and Josman Asnar were apparently suitors of the Chong sisters. Marijoy had apparently been threatened by Paco, who said that if she did not break up with her then-boyfriend, something bad may happen to her. Parents of the Chong sisters confirmed in an interview that their daughters told them how Paco would follow Mary Joy around school. Paco and his family vehemently denied this. According to Paco, he did not even know any of the Chongs at all. His family felt that the Chong family, especially Thelma Chong, was actively creating this narrative to implicate Paco in what happened to her daughters. In other words, the Laranyagas were accusing Thelma Chong of lying. It is believed by the Laranyaga family and by some internet detectives as well that Paco and the others were ultimately set up and made scapegoats. The, and I say this with respect to all the parties involved, of course, the conspiracy theory is that the Chong sisters were actually abducted and perhaps also killed by their father's former boss, who just happened to be a powerful drug lord. 
Junisho Chong was rumored to be a high-ranking member of a major drug ring in the Philippines. To the public, Mr. Chong was a respectable businessman who made his living with trucking, but the documentary and internet sleuths out there seem to suggest that he was using his trucking business to smuggle drugs all over the country. Just before his daughters disappeared, the trucking business had come under police investigation and Mr. Chong was apparently let go by his drug lord boss. As a result, Mr. Chong was called to testify against his former boss in front of a Congressional Committee on Dangerous Drugs. The belief, therefore, was that as a deterrent to Mr. Chong, his former boss decided to abduct and kill both of his daughters to send his former employee a strong message about not testifying. The documentary also strongly but implicitly suggested that any effort to perhaps expose this drug lord's actions would be futile because he was, or still is, very much well-connected to big government authorities such as the police, the military, customs, and parts of the judiciary. If this theory is true, then Mr. Chong's former boss certainly succeeded in his plan. Mr. Chong decided not to testify in front of Congress anymore. And this brings us back to that six-month mark when the police were still, from the looks of it, struggling to find any substantial evidence to tie the seven arrested men to the crime. At the time as well, Joseph, a.k.a. Erap Estrada, was president. And like presidents before him, he also asked the police authorities to solve the case expeditiously, seeing as the case has now garnered sincere national attention. However, from the Laranyaga's perspective, Erap was not just some president doing a presidential thing by publicly showing sympathy for those affected by the case. As you can see from the documentary, the Laranyagas felt that Arab's presence was very much in that case. He was omnipresent, so to speak, something that would go against several democratic principles about the executive branch of government not being involved with the judicial branch. The makers of the documentary would have us believe that there is some sort of connection between Arab and the Chongs. The connection was through Thelma Chong's sister, who happened to work for Erap at the time. This sister, Cheryl Jimenea, arranged a meeting with Erap and the Chongs, and after this meeting, lo and behold, Erap ordered four separate law enforcement agencies to collaboratively investigate and solve the case as quickly as possible. The Laranyagas also pointed out how Thelma was seen and even heard to be quote-unquote power brokering, as in offering prosecutors several attractive positions when, frankly, she did not have any authority to do so. This seems bizarre. I wished the makers of the documentary asked Thelma Chong about this connection to at least get a reaction or confirmation that she had in fact offered these positions or she hadn't. From the outside looking in, for us at least, it very much looked like bribery of some sort. Now, bear in mind, we are still in the days of preliminary investigation and as part of that effort to collect evidence, or hopefully find some evidence to connect to the seven men currently in jail, the Laranyaga farm in Cebu was raided after the police had apparently received reports about screaming and crying on the farm premises around the dates of the Chong sisters' abduction. Again, bizarrely enough, Cheryl Jimenea was present during this raid together with the prosecutor and the police. 
Now, I'm not an expert in Filipino public or administrative law, but her presence there looks to me like governmental overreach because, after all, she was representing Erap Estrada. She should not have been there, and it seems very odd that she was allowed to be part of this raid. Having said that, no body or bodies or any kind of evidence was found on the Laranyaga farm. Another nearby area was raided afterwards by the police because apparently they had received an affidavit from somebody about the presence of potential evidence somewhere else, but again, the police did not find anything. Now, you would think that by this time, the police would decide to either let the Chong 7 go or pursue a parallel investigation into other potential suspects, but they did not do any of this. Ten months after the Chong 7 were first taken into custody, Another young man was arrested in connection to the Chong sisters' abduction and Mary Joyce murder, Davidson Rusha. The police said that as soon as he was arrested, he confessed that he was part of the group that abducted the Chong sisters. He said that his conscience would not let him be, so he decided to speak out. His testimony would eventually become the basis of the prosecution's case against the Chong Seven. For ease, Rusha's version of events that I have included in this episode is what was included in court documents, specifically the Supreme Court decision from 2004. Link to this decision is, as always, in the sources list. So... What did Rusha had to say? On the 15th of July, 1997, according to Rusha, he was approached by Rowan Adlawan at the Cebu Plaza Hotel. They arranged to meet the following day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When they met the next day, Adlawan told him to stay put at the Ayala Mall as something big was going to happen that very evening. Rusha was under the impression that this big thing was just their friends partying together somewhere. Without asking for any further clarification, Rusha stayed put until the agreed time that evening. By 10.30 that evening, Adlawan went back to the Ayala Mall to meet Rusha, and this time he had another friend with him, Josman Asnar. Rushan met Adlawan and Aznar at the back exit of the mall, and they all then got into a white car before driving away. Rusha stated that moments later he noticed a red car following them. When the group in the white car reached Archbishop Avenue in Cebu, he saw two women standing at a waiting shed. Rusha did not know yet that these were Marie Joy and Jacqueline Chong. Aznar, according to Rusha, stopped the car in front of the two sisters. Adlawan apparently approached them to join the group in their car. The sisters declined. This did not sit right with Adlawan, who then proceeded to grab Marijoy. Aznar made sure to hold Jacqueline, and both men forced the sisters into the white car. The men with the Chong sisters then drove away. About 14 meters from where the sisters were abducted, Jacqueline managed to jump out of the car, but unfortunately, Josman Asnar chased her and dragged her back into the car. Suspecting that the young women might attempt to escape again, Adlawan elbowed Jacqueline on the chest and then punched Mary Joy in the stomach, causing both women to faint. Adlawan then asked Rusha for the packaging tape under Rusha's seat. Adlawan then used this to tape the women's mouths shut. He then handcuffed them jointly. The convoy of the red and white cars then drove to Fuente Osmeña in Cebu City. Arriving at Fuente Osmeña, Aznar parked the white car near a Mercury drugstore. 
He then told Rusha to inquire about a van that was parked nearby. Rusha was supposed to ask if that was for hire. A man who overheard this conversation told them that he was the owner and no, the van was not for hire. Rusha then stated that the group left the area and headed near the Park Place Hotel, where Rusha tried to negotiate to hire another van. There was none available. And so the convoy headed to Guadalupe, still in Cebu City, to a place known as the safe house of the quote-unquote Josman Asnar group. It was when both cars arrived at this safe house that Rusha finally saw who was in the red car. He saw the men he would later identify as Paco Laranaga, James Anthony Oy, and James Andrew Oy. According to Rusha, Laranaga, Anthony, and Adlawan took Marijoy to one of the rooms within the safe house, while Rusha and Aznar took Jacqueline to another room. Aznar then told Rusha to step out, so Rusha did and stayed in the living room with James Andrew. According to Rusha, their group remained in the safe house for 15 to 20 minutes. At that time, Rusha said he could hear Laranyaga, Anthony, and Adlawan giggling inside the room, essentially implying that the men were doing something untoward to Marijoy. Rusha then stated that after 15 to 20 minutes in the safe house, the women were dragged back into the white car. The convoy then headed to the South Bus Terminal, where they were finally able to hire a van and a driver. Another man called Ariel Balanasag tagged along as the driver's assistant. The group left the red car at the South Bus Terminal, but made sure the white car joined the van in another convoy. James Andrew was driving the white car, whilst the rest of the group was in the van. Rusha then recalled that inside the van, the women were slowly regaining their strength. James Anthony made sure to tape shut their mouths again, and Adlawan handcuffed them as well. At some point, according to Rusha, the van and the white car stopped at a barbecue store where Adlawan bought some barbecue and tandoi rum. The convoy then drove again and this time headed to Tanawan. The men parked their vehicle somewhere where they could drink their rum and eat their food. As I understand it, the men also smoked cannabis, with the court documents referring the men having a quote-unquote pot session. Afterwards, Rusha detailed what they did to the sisters. Just to warn you again, the details here can be upsetting, so make sure to skip this bit if you are triggered by details of sexual assault. Check the show notes for when you can listen again. I made sure to put the time mark there. Rusha stated that the men dragged Jacqueline out of the van and demanded that she danced for them. The men then encircled her like a prey. Rusha said that Jacqueline was pushed from one end of the circle to the other. This caused her clothes to eventually be ripped off during her ordeal. Rusha then recounted how Aznar told Paco Laranyaga to start raping Marijoy, who was still in the van at this point. Laranyaga did as told and apparently raped Marijoy inside the van for 15 to 20 minutes. He then emerged from the van and said, Who wants next? According to Rusha, Adlawan then went into the van, followed by James Anthony, another man called Albert Cow, the driver, and then Balanasag, the driver's assistant. Each of these men spent apparently a few minutes inside the van, and according to Rusia, came out smiling afterwards. Rusha then recalled how he and the other men carried Marijoy out of the van. Jacqueline was then brought into the van by Aznar, who apparently raped her for 10 minutes. He emerged from the van and announced, Whoever wants next, go ahead and hurry up. Rusha admitted 
that he then went inside the van and raped Jacqueline as well. He was followed by James Andrew. Around the same time, Rusha said that Marie Joy was led to the cliff near where they were parked. He confirmed that Adlawan and Balanasag pushed Marie Joy off the cliff and into a ravine that was around 150 meters deep. It was implied at this point that the group considered Marie Joy dead. The group's attention now turned to Jacqueline. She was pulled out of the van and then thrown to the ground. Jacqueline seemed like a fighter, at least according to Rusia's testimony. She gathered her last strength and made a run for the nearest road. The man then boarded their van and drove behind her, all the while taunting her and shouting at her words to the extent of, run some more. A tricycle then happened to pass by this scene, and it would become clear later that the tricycle driver, Mario Minosa, confirmed this sighting of Jacqueline, who he described as, running and looking disheveled with her blouse torn. He described how there was a white van driving behind her and that the people inside the van were playing very loud rock music. The tricycle driver did not give further details, but luckily Rusha was there to fill in the gaps. Rusha said that eventually, after trailing behind Jacqueline for a couple of minutes, the man dragged her back into the van. Adlawan then started beating her until she passed out. The group then drove back to Cebu City, where Rusha got off, somewhere near the Ayala Center. And this was where Rusha's testimony essentially ended. Suffice it to say, the details outlined by Rusha were horrific. But unfortunately, we don't get any information from him about the whereabouts or what happened to Jacqueline. It was now important for the prosecution to find corroborating evidence in order to prove what Rusha had to say in his testimony. In the trial, they presented several witnesses who they said could corroborate and prove that what Rusha said was true. The prosecution said that apart from the tricycle driver who saw Jacqueline running from the van full of men, there were a handful of people who could corroborate what Rusha said. For example, the prosecution during the trial were able to present to the court three people named Sheila Singson, Anali Konahab, and Willard Redobles, who testified that the Chong sisters were indeed talking to Paco Laranyaga and Josman Asnar before they were abducted. There was also Roland Dacilio, who said that he saw Jacqueline getting off the van, running away from it, and then getting dragged back into the van by Asnar. The prosecution also presented Alfred Duarte, who testified that he was at the barbecue stand where Adlawan stopped to buy food. According to him, Adlawan asked him where he could buy some tanduay rum. Duarte would also testify how he heard both male and female voices emanating from the van and how these voices sounded somehow hostile, as in it sounded like someone was arguing in the vehicle. Duarte would also go on to state that he heard a woman cry from within the van. He could not make out any words and described her voice as being controlled. Duarte then stated that after Adlawan got his barbecue order, he got into the van again and everyone drove off. The last corroborating witness found by the investigator and the prosecution, and who would later go on to testify in court, was Manuel Camingao. He recounted that on the 17th of July at about 5 in the morning, he saw a white van near a cliff in Tanawan. He initially thought that the passengers of the van were just there to throw some rubbish off the cliff, as some people were unfortunately wont to do. Camino then stated that for whatever reason, he noted down the number plate of the car on the side of his tricycle. Now, why he would do this isn't clear, but that was the testimony he gave. 
With all this new evidence against the men implicated by Rusha, it was clear that the police needed to finally charge them. It had almost been a year since Marijoy's body had been found, and the pressure on the police was mounting. And so they did, and the people of Cebu, if not the whole of the Philippines, thought they could breathe a bit easier. But what is the story from the defendants' perspectives? Now, in order to understand the story from the perspective of the defendants, and especially Paco Laranyaga, who was essentially accused as being the ringleader, again, we need to go back in time to 1997. This is where the documentary really helps to fill in some of the gaps in this story. But again, bear in mind, the documentary is not entirely unbiased. What we do learn in more depth from the documentary, as I already mentioned, is that friends and classmates of Paco claimed that in the evening of the 16th of July, 1997, until 3 o'clock in the morning of the 17th of July, Paco was with them at the R&R bar and restaurant in Quezon City. One friend even presented a photograph taken on the night of the 16th of July, clearly showing a smiling Paco in the background. According to the witnesses, Paco and the others were at that particular bar and restaurant because they were having a farewell celebration for Paco and a welcome celebration for another friend who had just arrived in Quezon City. Teachers also testified how Paco attended his classes the next day, the 17th of July, 1997, the day after Marijoy had apparently been killed and both sisters were abducted. Moreover, some neighbors and the security guard on duty at the Loyola Heights condominium where Paco was living would later also testify that Paco was definitely in his condo unit in the evening of July 16, 1997. Additionally, representatives of four airline companies flying the route of Manila, Cebu, Manila presented evidence showing that the name Francisco Juan Paco Laranyaga did not appear in the list of any pre-flight and post-flight manifests from July 15th to about noontime of July 17th. And so, for the Laranyaga, some things were not adding up. And things would continue to not add up, especially, as I mentioned already, none of Paco's witnesses were interviewed by the police in the course of their initial investigation. And then there was Rusha. Paco and the other six men claimed that they did not even know Rusha and had no idea why he would implicate them. Rusha seemed to have conveniently popped up 10 months into the Chong murder investigation and implicated everyone who were already in custody. For the Laranyagas and other observers of the case, this seemed more than just a stroke of luck in the police's investigation. Rusha, after giving his statement and later his testimony in court, was then afforded several privileges, if you like. He eventually became a state witness for the prosecution, for obvious reasons, when the trial started in September 1998. He was then offered blanket immunity, despite admitting that he participated in the crimes that he accused the others of as well. Remember, he admitted to participating in the rape of the sisters. Another thing that did not add up from the defendant's perspective was the behavior of Rusha during the trial. Now, Rusha took the stand for several days, but only to present his testimony. According to the documentary and to the court records as well, the defense was never able to cross-examine him completely. The defense was never able to question him about inconsistencies that they have found in his testimony, such as being acquainted with Laranyaga or Aznar. They also wanted to ask him if it was true that the only reason he had come forward was because he was tortured and coerced into making a confession. After all, 
The defense team had several affidavits signed by Rusha's prison cellmates who said as much. In the documentary, we see that, apparently, Rusha refused to be cross-examined because he was not feeling well enough to take the witness stand again for cross-examination. The judge allowed this, terminated the cross-examination not only due to Rusha's reported poor health, but also due to rumors about attempts to bribe him. Both reasons, in my mind, not good enough to dismiss a cross-examination with such finality. At the very least, the judge could have called for a recess until Rusha felt better. Those who loved to speculate as to Rusha's true motives for turning himself in and for giving the confession that he gave thought that, of course, he would not want to be questioned and cross-examined. Doubts were raised about him from the very beginning. Firstly, none of the Chong Seven knew Rusha, as already mentioned. Secondly, Rusha has a criminal record in the United States, which should affect his credibility as a witness at the very least. Thirdly, he has a history of drug addiction and potentially mental health issues with alleged previous attempts to commit suicide. The defense would also later argue in a separate motion that Rusha did not even pass the test for becoming a state witness and should therefore not be treated as such in the first place. Now, in order for me to understand how someone could become a state witness, I did a little bit of research about that as well and found a very helpful blog post by a blogger called bataspinoy.wordpress.com. That link is in the sources list and you can read this rather long blog post about that topic in there. Suffice it to say, in the first bit of the blog post, I would assume that Rusha sort of qualified as a state witness, but then again, I'm not a criminal law expert from the Philippines. But I do get that as defense lawyers, the legal team that was defending the Chong Seven would try everything to disqualify Rusha as a state witness because this was in the best interest of their clients. Nevertheless, Rusha was allowed to give his testimony and the court allowed him to do so before even dealing with the motion from the defense to disqualify Rusha as a state witness. This was a rather bizarre move, but it was too late for the defense to put in any other motion to stop Rusha from stating what he knew about the case. So the defense's only strategy now is to cross-examine him. And, of course, they were not happy that they were not able to finish their cross-examination. And I can certainly understand this frustration despite me not being a criminal lawyer. As a defense lawyer, when you cannot even completely pick apart the prosecution's case, you are prevented from representing your client and their best interest. And to see that the judge seemed a bit too comfortable with this omission of a full cross-examination, I can understand why the lawyers did what they did afterwards. The defense lawyers, in what I can only call righteous indignation moved for the inhibition of the trial judge, Judge Ocampo. This simply means that they were questioning the impartiality of the judge and were asking him to recuse himself. Judge Ocampo did not recuse himself as he did not find valid and just reasons to do so. He took this as an offense. As a response, the defense lawyers of all seven accused walked out together in protest, declaring that they would no longer attend the trial. Judge Ocampo was not amused by this and held all of them in contempt, ordering them to be taken into custody. This left all seven men without legal representation, and it also meant that the trial needed to be halted. 
A motion to delay the trial was lodged by the defense, but oddly enough, the motion was denied. Instead, the defense were assigned public defenders from the Public Attorney's Office or PAO. In the documentary, we are informed that these lawyers did not really have enough time to prepare their case or get to know their clients. When the trial resumed a few days after the original lawyers walked out, we are also told by the Larañagas in the documentary that the public defenders barely did any cross-examination of the remaining prosecution witnesses, nor did they object to perhaps dubious things that the prosecution presented or said in the trial. Certainly, for the families of the seven men, they must have felt like their loved ones were not being properly and effectively represented, and I may have to agree. However, and this is the big however, Supreme Court documents do show that Rusha was cross-examined by the new defense lawyers in October. Specifically, Rusha was cross-examined on the 5th, 6th, 12th, and 13th of October, 1998. Now, I am not sure if this omission by the filmmakers was on purpose or not, but these are the kinds of things that people need to be aware of when watching true crime documentaries. A documentary filmmaker, whether related to the subject of the film or not, will always have an angle. Sometimes the angles are obvious, like the one on Paco, and some are very subtle. So take everything with a grain of salt. Now, I do have to say that despite Rusha being cross-examined after all, it does not, of course, automatically mean that the cross-examination was effective, that the defense was able to poke in the kind of holes that they really want to poke into the prosecution's case. We can only speculate as to the quality of lawyering by the Pau lawyers who did not know the case as well as the original defense team. What the public defenders did manage to do quite well, I suppose, was to cross-examine Thelma Chong. Despite their apparent unpreparedness, the defense managed to elicit from Mrs. Chong that upon looking at the lifeless body of the woman recovered from Karkar, she was initially not even sure if the woman was any of her two daughters at all. Only later, when the police maintained that the fingerprints of the body found in Karkar matched Mary Joy's fingerprints from her voter's ID, did the consensus form that the dead person was Mary Joy, a notion to which Mrs. Chong eventually subscribed to as well. And this is when the defense stepped up to the plate. So credit where credit is due, really. The defense team informed the court that if permitted, they would be able to present evidence that would show that the body recovered from Karakar was in fact not Mari Joy. Initially, the motion to present this evidence was allowed. The defense prepared their experts and documents for their presentation to the judge, but just before the defense team was supposed to present said evidence, Judge Ocampo changed his mind. He stated that he would not allow the defense's experts to present evidence anymore because, according to him, it did not even matter whether the body was Mari Joyce or not. I cannot emphasize enough how bizarre this ruling is. Common sense alone would dictate that if the court deemed the deceased to not be who the prosecution said it was, then at the very least, the judge should be declaring a mistrial. I could be wrong and would love to hear a Filipino criminal lawyer explain the situation to me because, frankly, this is just very, very odd. Now, according to the documentary, this was the reason the defense team walked out and was eventually held in contempt of court and not the delay in cross-examining Rusha. 
Again, I am worried that the makers of the documentary have slightly changed something here for the sake of perhaps drama, when really there is no shortage of that in this story. Again, I could be wrong. And I am only comparing what is officially in the Supreme Court document and the documentary that was published. Moving on, we are also told by the documentary that apparently all prosecution witnesses, including those who corroborated Rusha's version of events, were given money after their testimony. From the perspective of the seven defendants, this looked like a concerted effort to build a case against them that was all based on lies and deception. We were also told by the makers of the documentary and from news interview video clips that Thelma Chong admitted to developing a rather good relationship with Davidson Rusha, who she then eventually gifted with money, clothing, and food. Now, for obvious reasons in the documentary, we see this relationship framed as something odd, knowing that Rusha admitted to raping the Chong sisters. I guess with or without the documentary, we can all agree that state witness or not, most mothers would probably not even look the way of their child's rapist, even if said rapist confessed and implicated all the other perpetrators. It just strengthens the many suspicions by the Laranyagas that somehow Rusha was a plant. And no, I don't mean that Rusha was something inanimate and green. I just mean that Rusha was somehow purposefully and conveniently placed in the middle of the investigation to be the focal point of the prosecution's case and to legitimize and to inject some credibility into the police's and prosecution's case because, after all, they were not investigating anybody else. They wanted the seven men to be the defendants, to be the convicted in this case. By November 1998, it was time for the defense to finally present their case. At the core of Paco's defense were the many friends and classmates who saw and were with Paco. We have already heard about them extensively earlier in this episode. But what I did not mention was that not all of them were able to actually give evidence in court. Eventually, Judge Ocampo said, by the time the 13th witness was giving their testimony, that this witness was lying. Judge Ocampo eventually did not allow any more witnesses from Paco's school to testify. Unsurprisingly, the judge was not the only one trying to derail the defense's case. When the photo was presented where one could clearly see Paco with his friends on the night the Chong sisters were abducted, the prosecution said that the picture could be and must be doctored. In the documentary, we are told that the reason for this belief was that the color of the chair Paco was sitting on in one of the pictures was different from the rest of the chairs on which his friends and classmates were sitting. Personally, I thought that this counter-argument by the prosecution was rather weak. Anyone who has been a student or has visited a student bar or a restaurant beloved by students would know that the chairs and tables and generally the furniture in those establishments are not necessarily the best or will not always be looking uniform. The chairs might have different colors, the tables might be broken, and the bar could be completely chaotic. But then again, maybe that's just my experience of establishments that I have frequented when I was a student. Anyway, moving on. The prosecution also said that since Paco was not looking at the camera and everyone else was, the picture could not be genuine. 
To be honest with you, I see what the prosecution was trying to do here, but looking at the photos in the documentary, it is hard for me to believe that this was some elaborate attempt at photo manipulation in a time when Photoshop had not been invented yet, or when such similar softwares were not really readily available or accessible to the everyday person. Have a look at it yourselves and let me know what you think. In the YouTube video, which I have linked in the sources list, the part about the chair is at Mark 3657. Now, what we do not learn from the Supreme Court documents or reports from the time, but we do learn from the documentary, was that Paco's friends would also talk about how it was constantly insinuated that they were lying and how they were also intimidated, not only by the prosecution, but also by Judge Ocampo. Some of this we've already seen when Judge Ocampo said stop to the witnesses coming from Paco's school and also from the prosecution's insinuation about the photos being doctored. Some of Paco's friends and even teachers back in culinary school described the trial during the time when they took the stand as a circus. Apart from the red flags that I've already mentioned about Judge Ocampo, there was also a point when Judge Ocampo repeatedly told the defense that they needed to refute the possibility of Paco being in Cebu the evening the sisters were abducted. From the point of view of the Laranyagas, they thought that Judge Ocampo was under the impression that Paco had the means to fly privately from Manila to Cebu on the 16th of July and to fly back for his exams the next morning. The Laranyagas resented this implication. They admitted that they owned a farm, but they also said that they were hard-working people. Yes, they might be connected to the Osmanias of Cebu, but they were not rich, or not as rich as Judge Ocampo might have probably thought with his musings about private jets and all. Lastly, we are also told in the documentary that Paco wanted to take the stand in his own defense and even raised his hand to signal as much. According to Paco, he was ignored and was not given the chance to testify about his innocence. This again strikes me as odd, and maybe this is yet again a difference in criminal procedural rules between the Philippines and the UK where I have studied, but surely there is a constitutional right to take the stand in one's own defense in a criminal trial. This is not a light decision to reach for any defendant because if a defendant decides to practice that right, he needs to then be cross-examined by the prosecution, which can be a very difficult situation to be in. Obviously, Paco was aware of this and was ready to take on this challenge. However, he was never given the chance. I also wonder now what his lawyer was doing by not making sure that Paco was able to give his testimony. In any case, the trial ended eventually and Judge Ocampo announced that he would need three months to finalize and write up his decision. In the meantime, Rusia was granted his freedom and was released from custody. He was said to have returned to Bohol, where he now apparently lives, with a partner. Thelma Chong admitted in the documentary that whenever Rusha is in Manila, he comes to visit her. I still cannot get over how these two have struck this friendship despite Rusha saying that he raped her daughter. And I can truly understand why a lot of people did not believe Rusha and still don't believe him. The trial court's decision was handed down on the 5th of May 1999. All seven men were found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the crimes of kidnapping and serious illegal detention. 
Each of them were sentenced to two life sentences and to pay the heirs of the victims, sisters Mari Joy and Jacqueline Chong, jointly and severally the amount of 200,000 as actual damages and 5 million as moral and exemplary damages. As shown in the documentary, no one was happy with the decision. The Chong Seven and their families wanted to see their loved ones acquitted. And Mr. and Mrs. Chong wanted that the seven men be sentenced to death. There was a lot of commotion in the courtroom after the decision was read out, which lasted for two hours, by the way. Of course, the story does not end there because after the trial comes the appeal. The Department of Justice lodged an appeal with the support of the Chong family and then-President Estrada. They all wanted the sentence to be changed to the death penalty. The defense, especially Paco's legal team, also filed an appeal, citing multiple violations of the men's constitutional rights. Details of these violations, as cited by the seven men's lawyers, can be found in the Supreme Court document I have included in the sources list. Be warned, it is a long and tedious read. Some of the violations raised by the defense had to do with the fact that Judge Ocampo stopped some defense witnesses from giving evidence or the fact that Rusha was made a state witness even though he should not have been or that the court demonstrated animosity towards defense witnesses showing bias and prejudice. Whilst waiting for the Supreme Court's decision in the appeal, the nation was rocked by the news of Judge Ocampo's death. The police assigned to the case reported that Judge Ocampo was found dead in a hotel room. Initial examination indicated that he died by suicide. The pathologist interviewed in the documentary explained that the judge initially tried to end his life by slitting his wrist and then the veins in his feet. However, this did not have the desired effect. As a last resort, it seems that Judge Ocampo saw no other option but to reach out for a gun and shoot himself in the head. The police explained that he left behind a detailed suicide note, explaining how his rented house and his estate were to be dealt with, amongst other details. The documentary, in my opinion, would like us to infer potentially two things, that Judge Ocampo committed suicide because he felt guilty for how he handled the Chong Laranyaga case, or that it was not suicide at all. That maybe someone was not happy that he sentenced the seven men to life in prison instead of imposing the death penalty, and that this someone felt it was necessary to take the judge's life as a punishment. Or that someone was not happy that he found the seven men guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. Either way, his death opened up a whole new door of several conspiracy theories. As for the Chong Seven, it was decided that whilst waiting for their appeal's result, they must sit their sentence in the new Belibid prison in Muntinglupa instead of staying in Cebu. And that wait took a very long time. When the appeal was first made, Erap Estrada was still president of the Philippines. By the time the Supreme Court was ready to announce its decision, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo had taken over the deposed Estrada and would be duly elected only months later. The Supreme Court handed down their decision on the 3rd of February, 2004. The Supreme Court's decision touched upon the theory of the case by the prosecution, which was largely based on Rusha's testimony. It briefly touched upon the alibis provided by the defendants, and then it addressed the violations raised by the seven defendants. I will not go into the details of each point raised and how the Supreme Court ruled, but it is quite a read that will make you say, what the fuck, a few times. One excerpt that I want to cite here is in relation to the testimonies given by some of Paco's friends and classmates. Bear in mind, the appellants in this case were the seven accused. And I quote, 
Appellants consider as violation of their right to due process Judge Ocampo's remarks labeling Rebecca Senos and Catalina Paghinayan's testimony as incredible. Clotilde Soterol as a totally confused person who appears to be mentally imbalanced and Salvador Boton and Paolo Celso as liars. Suffice it to state that after going over the pertinent transcript of stenographic notes, we are convinced that Judge Ocampo's comments were just honest observations intended to warn the witnesses to be candid to the court. He made it clear that he merely wanted to ascertain the veracity of their testimonies in order to determine the truth of the matter in controversy. End of quote. Frankly, I found it oddly generous of the Supreme Court to not even see something wrong in this rather unprofessional behavior by the judge. Even if the judge did not mean to be biased by his comments, he certainly appeared to be biased. Needless to say, the Supreme Court upheld the trial court's verdict. But what really shocked all parties was that the Supreme Court decided to elevate the sentence from two life sentences to the death penalty. The Supreme Court did not agree with Judge Ocampo when he decided that two life sentences would suffice as punishment. This was a blow to the seven men, obviously. They immediately filed a motion for reconsideration as soon as the decision was handed down. And by 2005, the Supreme Court denied the motion. The seven men were headed to death row, and it felt, at least for the Laranyagas, like this was the end of the road. But, as we have seen in the documentary, it was far from the end, at least for Paco. In an effort to save Paco from the death penalty, the Laranyagas, both in the Philippines and in Spain, worked to get the international community involved in Paco's case. As you know, Paco's father is a Spanish national, and from what we are told in the documentary, Paco is also Spanish. Whether he possesses both Spanish and Filipino citizenship was not made clear. In any case, Relatives in Spain reached out to a nonprofit in London called Fair Trials International. On their website, FTI described themselves as a global criminal justice watchdog. They identify the problems and failings in a criminal justice system, alert the public about them, and find solutions to the issues raised. FTI were made aware of Paco's situation and they decided to take on the case. Since Paco and the others' appeal to the Supreme Court had failed, the FTI thought that the only way to perhaps help Paco was to write an amicus curiae brief. Amicus curiae is Latin and means friend of the court. In modern legal systems, an amicus brief is usually sent in by an interested non-party. This brief is typically filed at the appellate level and puts forward arguments or information in support of or against one of the parties to the case. This is a way to intervene in a case without having legal standing in it. In Paco's case, we are not told of the specifics of the brief, but we know that the brief pleaded for Paco's conviction to be quashed, most probably citing the same issues that all defendants had already raised when the case was first appealed in the Supreme Court. We are informed in the documentary that whilst the brief was working its way to the Philippine Supreme Court, a big media campaign headed by one Spanish publication started collecting signatures from the Spanish public who would also like to see Paco freed through the efforts of their government. Amnesty International had also become involved at some point and this gave Paco's case even more publicity. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, the Supreme Court had refused to acknowledge the international community's pressure on them. 
The court reaffirmed the death penalty sentence given to the Chong Seven. And later on, when the seven men attempted a second and final appeal, the Supreme Court decided to deny this as well. From a judicial point of view, all avenues had been exhausted with the Philippines. Supporters of Paco, especially the FTI, decided that it was time to get the United Nations Committee for Human Rights involved. The UNCHR decided pretty quickly that they were going to get involved and therefore took on the case. They took some time to issue their ruling, and when they did, they raised the same issues that the Chong Seven did during their Supreme Court appeals, if not more. The committee ruled that overall there was insufficient evidence to convict Paco and the other six men. They agree that all seven men were denied justice. They also agreed that Judge Ocampo was obstructive during the trial. They then reminded the Philippine government that it is a signatory party of the ICCPR, or the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a multilateral treaty adopted by the United Nations. In a nutshell, the signatories of the covenant commit to respecting the civil and political rights and freedoms of its people. These rights include the right to a fair trial, due process, the freedom of assembly, religious freedom, or freedom of speech. In the case of the seven men, specifically Paco, the committee ruled that the Philippines was in contravention of Article 6, 7, 9 and 14. These articles cover the right to life, the right not to be subjected to cruel, inhuman, and degrading torture or punishment, the right to liberty and security, and the right to be seen as equal before all courts and tribunals. The committee added that, in their opinion, the Supreme Court failed to respond to the defendant's appeals adequately. Having said all that, the committee reminded the Philippines that it is under obligation to provide the seven men effective remedy, which should include a commutation of their sentences given by the Supreme Court. The committee's ruling is not to be underestimated despite the limited reach of its effect. A ruling from the committee cannot be enforced the same way a court's judgment can be enforced in a particular country, but it does put a lot of pressure on a country's government who, by now, would feel the eyes of the international community on it. In Paco's case, however, the Philippine government did not engage with the ruling, nor did it respond to letters calling out the government's contravention of the ICCPR. Okay, just a sidebar here before I continue the story. In the documentary, we see someone from Fair Trials International being interviewed. Her name is Sara Damas, and she seemed to be the main person who dealt with Paco's case at the time. At one point in the documentary, she indicated that it was very problematic that the Philippines did not even dignify the committee or the many calls from the international community with an answer. Especially because the Philippines is a recipient of a lot of foreign aid, not only from several Western countries, but also from the EU. I took massive issue with this comment, even though I admire what her nonprofit did for this case. Just because a country like the Philippines receives foreign aid money from entities such as the EU does not mean that it needs to ignore its own sovereignty as an independent country and do the bidding of those who financially contribute to it. And this is coming from me with dual citizenship and also with an EU citizenship by virtue of my German citizenship. It is a rather condescending, patronizing, and antiquated notion that as a country, we are somehow beholden to those who give us money because we absolutely are not. Unless there is an agreement in the vein of a tit-for-tat arrangement, we do not and must not ignore the systems we have in place when running the country. 
we are still very much our own sovereign and independent country with laws and rules to follow. I remember thinking that this mentality demonstrated by Miss Damas was giving me very much colonizer vibes, for lack of a better term. But that is a topic for a different discussion. Now, back to the case. It is not clear whether the Philippine government ever gave a formal response to the committee, but what we do know is that in November 2005, the Spanish defense minister landed in the Philippines on an official state visit. During that visit, as shown in the documentary, Jose Bono, the minister, managed to make President Arroyo commit to Paco's safety, meaning as long as she was president, Paco would not be executed. President Arroyo committed also to do everything to help Paco. And whilst you wonder how the executive branch of the government could interfere with a judicial ruling by the Supreme Court, wonder no more because theoretically it cannot. Sure, a president can issue executive orders, but something as controversial and important as capital punishment needs to be deliberated in the legislature. Now, in the documentary, somehow, we are led to believe that because of that meeting with Jose Bono, capital punishment was then abolished by June 2006, some six months after. But seeing as the law passed by Congress must have gone through the usual lawmaking process, I would assume that the bill had been making its slow way through Congress and Senate for a long time, even before Jose Bono visited the Philippines. Passing laws is not an expeditious matter after all. This is just my hunch on how things really went down back in 05 and 06, because what I do know is that Arroyo, as a person and as a politician, has always been a vocal opponent of the death penalty, even before her presidency and her vice presidency before 2001. However, the only thing that this abolition of the death penalty had achieved for the seven men was that it was not on the table anymore. The death penalty was officially off the table, but it did not quash their conviction and they still needed to sit their two life sentences. And so the efforts to get the seven men out of custody completely had to continue. For Paco, this meant further cooperation with representatives of the Spanish government. As a result, in 2007, an agreement was signed between Spain and the Philippines. The agreement, which is still in effect to this day, essentially allows a transfer of convicts between the two countries, giving the imprisoned individuals the chance to sit their sentence in their own country. Obviously, any sovereign country is allowed to sign an agreement with any entity for purposes deemed important to that country. Whether such an agreement is done with the legislature's ratification or not is ultimately governed by whatever national laws applicable. However, in the case of the Spanish agreement, it seemed to me, as an outsider of course, that this was arranged and signed for the sole purpose of perhaps correcting the wrongs of the trial and Supreme Courts in the Chong Seven case without really acknowledging them as wrongs. One could also say that the Filipino government had finally felt all the pressure from the international community and thought that this was the only way to get Paco out of New Belibid prison and give him a chance to be rehabilitated or to sit his sentence in Spain. Either way, I can see why the public had a mixed reaction to the agreement. Then Foreign Affairs Secretary Alberto Romolo had to defend the agreement and felt it was necessary to explain to the public that this agreement was not at all a one-way street. He emphasized that Filipinos incarcerated in Spain will also be able to benefit from this agreement. Furthermore, he explained that other countries have similar agreements with the Philippines. 
he cited Thailand and Hong Kong as his main examples, so as to make sure that the public understood that this agreement with Spain was not unique. Nevertheless, a lot of Filipinos still remain on the fence about the nature and purpose of this agreement in relation to Paco Larañaga. As for Paco, he was transferred to Spain on the 5th of October 2009, despite last-ditch efforts by the Chongs to stop his departure from the Philippines. We are told in the documentary that Paco is classed as a third-grade prisoner in Spain because of time he had already served in the Philippines. As a perk to this classification, Paco could ask to be paroled and therefore serve the remainder of his sentence outside. Whilst this is a development and improvement from his situation in the Philippines, it does not really give him what he and his family wanted, absolute pardon and freedom. By 2010, the documentary informs us that Paco is still in prison in Spain. The parole board made it clear to him at every review that he would only be allowed to be paroled if he admitted guilt. He was not willing to do this, and is still not willing to do this. The documentary essentially leaves us with the information that both the Larañaga and Chong families, and surely the other families as well, are fighting for what they think should happen to their loved ones. As far as updates are concerned, we know that in 2015, it was reported that Paco was allowed to finish culinary school and that he was allowed to work outside of prison on a part-time basis as a chef. He still needs to go back to prison every night to sleep there. In a Facebook post in the account dedicated to informing about Paco's legal journey, Paco wrote that he is doing well but he also still maintains that he is innocent. He urges people to also listen to the stories of his six co-accused men, who he called victims of injustice as well. Three years later in 2018, when President Duterte was already sitting president, news outlets reported that Paco and his family were seeking to ask Duterte for clemency potentially in the hope to have Paco come back to the Philippines and out of the Spanish prison he is still in. It has to be said that Paco's lawyers have tried to file similar clemency petitions with other presidents before Duterte, but to no avail. The next year, in September 2019, Senator Panfilo Lacson revealed to the media that three of the other six accused men in the Chong case had been released. The three men, Aznar, Balanasag, and Kao, essentially benefited from the good conduct time allowance law that was enforced that same year. This was the same law that was supposed to release the late Mayor Antonio Sanchez from prison following his guilty verdict in the murder and rape of Eileen Sarmenta and murder of Alan Gomez. After protest in a presidential intervention, Sanchez's release was halted and he stayed in prison until his death in March 2021. Despite this announcement, news came through only days after that those who had been released under the GCTA may have been rearrested as per the president's orders. What is clear, however, was that President Duterte ordered more than 2,000 released inmates to surrender following the fallout of the GCTA law. In some reports, it was confirmed that Balanasag and Cao surrendered shortly after the president's announcement and are now back in custody. The same reports also stated that Aznar was expected to surrender soon, but it is unknown whether he already had. What I found odd was that in the same report, one of the Uy brothers, James Anthony, was confirmed as being the fourth person being released amongst the Chong Seven. He was also expected to surrender following Duterte's urgent announcement. However, it is not entirely clear if, as a whole, most of the released convicts had indeed come back. 
Just another sidebar here. I have been calling one of the Chong 7 Alberto Cao, the driver, this whole time, but some articles call him Alberto Caño. I have a sneaky feeling now that some articles may have just forgotten the Enye and went with the name Cao. So I will not go back to the earlier parts of this episode to correct the recording, but now that you know it, just know that it might be Alberto Caño and that might be his true name. Now back to the case. With the negative reception of the GCTA law also came questions about Paco's status in Spain. It did not sit right with a lot of lawmakers and politicians that Paco is allowed to pursue a job outside of prison. They demanded that inquiries be made about his status, the things he is allowed to do, and the future of his sentence. So far, I have not seen any movement by the government to follow the lawmaker's advice, so this remains to be seen. Ultimately, amidst the uproar about the GCTA law and the president's very optimistic yet most probably useless callback of the released prisoners, came the anguish from the Chong family. Thelma Chong said the release of the convicts caused the family to relive the pain from over 20 years ago, especially since the convicts were released just days before Mary Joy's supposed 43rd birthday and Jacqueline's supposed 45th birthday. Needless to say, this case is still reopening old wounds after over 20 years. The Chong family, no matter what you might think of them, is visibly still grieving their two daughters, whilst families of the Chong Seven have invested most of their lives and money to help their sons and brothers, making sure that they find a way to finally free them from incarceration. No matter how this case pans out in the end, or whether this is the end of it all already, the amount of hurt and destruction this case had cost could never be alleviated or remedied. And with this, I want to end this episode, I think the longest episode so far in Lagim history. Thank you for sticking with me. I have no recommendations this week, but I do want to thank you for all the lovely messages and comments during my short mental health break. It was much needed. I am hoping that things will be looking up from here on out. I am certainly excited for the future because I have other projects lined up and I'm so excited to tell you about them when the right time comes. So keep your eyes peeled and make sure to stay up to date by following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. All links are in the show notes. Thank you again. Maraming salamat at mabuhay.